live in five, four. Good, e good evening and welcome to the November 15th, uh, 2017 meeting of the North Idaho College Board of Trustees. Would you please all rise and join us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Brad, if you wouldn't mind um, be reading our mission statement, oh, sure. remind us of our goals and where we're at. All right. North Idaho mission statement. North Idaho College meets the diverse educational needs of students, employers, in the northern Idaho communities it serves through a commitment to student success, educational excellence, community engagement, and lifelong learning. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, Real quick, before you get too far into the meeting, I had the opportunity to meet with our auditor this afternoon, and I wanted to make a motion, because she has a plane to catch, I wanted to make a motion to move up her presentation uh, before the special report, if that would Which is the be okay tab four? Board. Correct. All right. Pardon? Oh, she's tab four, yeah. Move right. up special report. So you want to move that up uh, to? Uh, right after public comment. Right. Any objection? And exercising my prerogative, we'll go ahead and do that. Thank you. Good. Especially since you suggested it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, very, we have a quorum. All the trustees are here. Uh, no particular special guests here. You're all special. Um, and then the review of the minutes. Anybody have any comments on the minutes? Last meeting. I think I have one. Let me see if I can find it. Again. Oh, Mr. Chair, I had one. Uh, in looking at the minutes on page five, remarks for the good of the order. The second paragraph about trustee commented on the fall meeting IBE. Blah, blah. She went on to mention the governor's state of the state address scheduled in November. Probably needs some clarification. He'll do his state of the state address in January. But he was here in Coeur d'Alene doing the governor's state of things. <laughs> I don't know what the right word is. What would you suggest the change be in order to... Uh, by the minutes. Suspension of the governor's state, the state address to the Ch Coeur d'Alene Chamber of Commerce. I'm sorry? To uh, take out the word, well, or in November, to the Coeur d'Alene Chamber of Commerce. S scheduled in November to the Coeur d'Alene well, Chamber of Commerce? Yep, sure. She went on to mention the governor's state of the address scheduled in November to the Coeur d'Alene Chamber of Commerce. Does that make sense? My words must be, you want to touch that up, Laura? You're the word wordsmith. All right. I'm just checking with Laura. Does that make sense? I think you were there. It works. It was yeah. It was a luncheon that the governor spoke at here in yep. November. Okay. In the chamber. All right. So you want to add to the Chamber of Commerce after November in the to the Coeur d'Alene Chamber of Commerce. Yep. Right. Thank you. All right. Any objection? All right. So we'll amend the minutes to include to the Chamber of Commerce after the word November in that. Uh, Second paragraph down under remarks for the good of the order. Any other amendments? Yes. I have a question, sir. Was there a concern in the minutes or a question about the motions that were made and seconded at the last meeting? Is there any clarification that needed to be made on that, or were we comfortable with how they were um, Thank you. Can I you? accounted for? Yeah. Uh, Where are we on this? What are we looking at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Todd had a question about whether there's any clarification on the this, the motions and the seconds from the Thank last you. meeting. Yes, we had a discussion about clarifying yes. the, the minutes last time. In the interim, what we have done is gone back and looked at the minutes from the preceding meeting. <laughs> and the motion that I made that I said was seconded by Todd was, in fact, not done. Right? I, yeah. So we'd have to do it again as we go through this process. So um, the minutes from the I September meeting stand as presented. We don't have to modify them. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? The Comments? September minutes. Additions? Okay. okay. The minutes will be accepted as modified. The next um, agenda item is uh, public comment, and nobody has signed up for public comment. So pursuant to our 
agreement. Uh, we've, we're moving tab four, which is the financial audit, up to the next order of business. Chairman Howard, members of the board, um, it's November, which is our uh, annual review of the financial audit for North Idaho College. Uh, it, is, it is my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, back to NIC and to you uh, Jody Doherty. She's with Ide Bailey, who is our accounting firm who does our fiscal audit. Uh, once again, the college is in uh, great financial shape, and I will uh, at this point turn it over to Jody to uh, provide some comments and answer questions. Mr. Chair, may I ask one quick question? Chris, I noticed in our book it's got draft stamped all over it. I'm guessing at some point we're going to get something that's GBC bound with a cover and it's going to be the official. Yes, sir. Um, is this subject to change what we're seeing tonight or is this what the final version will look like? Mr. Chairman, uh, Trustee Banducci, uh, until the board accepts the audit, it will be marked draft and there is one change from what you received tonight and it's, it's a good change. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. No problem. Jody? All right, Welcome. Thank you. I want to thank you for allowing us to be your auditors th uh, this year, and I want to thank Chris and Sarah and their whole team. Uh, they are amazing, and they make this audit run as smoothly as it does. And um, they were ready for us when we came out, and the, it ran really well this year. So I want to thank them for a job well done. So I did meet with um, Trustee Wood earlier and went over the financial statements in a little more detail than what I'll go over now, but if you have any questions, um, feel free to stop me and ask them at any time. So first of all, and most importantly to you, is Ide Bailey's opinion on these financial statements. Oh, and I do want to start by saying that the financial statements were prepared by Sarah and her team. So everything in here was done by uh, your staff. So our opinion letter uh, on page three at the very top is where we have our opinion. And it says that in our, our opinion, the financial statements that you have presented before you um, present fairly the financial position of the college and its component unit, which is the foundation. I think we had a few uh, minor adjustments to the trial balance that we were given, but nothing significant. So the financial statements that you have before you is the financial information you've been receiving all year long. The first part of the financial statement is what's called the management's discussion and analysis. And this was written by Chris with the help of Sarah. And this is management's overview of what happened during the year and what's in the financial statements. Uh, that's starting on page five. Okay. So this will give you a, a brief overview of what happened and highlight some of the significant items throughout the year. Um, so it's something that you can read just for some information on what happened. So the first financial statement is called the statement of net position and that's your balance sheet for a more commonly used word. Uh, on page 15 is where it shows your net position which is another way of saying your the equity of the college. And you ended the year with 71 million, 71.2 million in net position. I just want to point out that of that 71 million 56.4 is in your capital assets so in your buildings and other equipment that you might have so 56 million of it's not liquid equity per se the 10.4 million that you see there is what's sitting in unrestricted net position and that's what you base your budgets off of going forward every year uh, I also want to point out, if you don't mind flipping real quick to page 24, there's a footnote that does clarify that, and it's under unrestricted net position, and it clarifies there that of that 10.4 million, the, you, the board, have designated three point, almost 3.7 million for your uh, capital expenditures. And so you have chosen to set aside that uh, 3.7 Six million, three point seven million. 
And so that's part that's sitting inside that 10.4 million. Any questions on any of that? Uh, yes. The, the, between 16 and 17, uh, on the unrestricted um, funds, uh, is a difference of about seven million dollars. Right, and I, Chris can clarify, or where do you? Oh. <laughs> um, I think part of that was what you spent this year on building that the the CTB building. That's that, right, and I guess I'd just like to have you say that or explain it <laughs> because it looks strange here when you just look at it in the in the audit. It does. It does appear strange. And so, going, we talked about this a little bit with with Trustee Wood this afternoon. But going back in our time machine, uh, the board um, had the wisdom to set aside the the idea for the CTE building that we would spend 15 million dollars um, over the course of that project um, towards the construction of that building. And last year was the the final year of that, and was our biggest hit towards that construction cost. And that really is what's represented in that change in that position from year to year of seven million dollars. Thank you. And to clarify as well, if you look up at the net position that was invested in your capital assets, you'll see that that increased by $10 million. So that's partly where that $7 million went. It went, it moved up into your, your, your assets, basically. Any other questions? No. Just general questions? Go. Remind me, is there a spot in here where you guys venture an opinion along a couple lines? One, um, we have found discrepancies, we found no discrepancies, and two, we determine the financial health to be bad, good, great, and three, maybe we see the level of reserves as too low, appropriate, or too high based on standards, you know, things like that. Do we ever get any of those well, sort of So the first question, comments? yes, and there's a letter in here that I will get to in a minute that talks about the controls and any findings that we have. Uh, the other two are not part of an audit engagement, so there will be no opinion on those last two. Okay, thank you. All right, the, the next statement on page 16 is the changes in your net position, which is, this is your income statement. And just to point out that right in the middle of the page, you'll see that there's an operating loss. That is expected and that is how uh, you operate because a big chunk of your funding comes in from state appropriations and property taxes, which are defined as non-operating so that's why that shows up like that. But if you go down towards the bottom, you'll see that you did have a net income or you increased your net position by the $4.3 million this year. Any questions on that income statement? No, but I'll make a comment. I find that funny because I don't know about the rest of you, but I got my tax statement in the mail yesterday. And then I see was my fourth highest number on there, 6.884% increase from last year. I thought that was interesting, 16 to 17. So I guess that's my part of the four million. And we all thank you for that. <laughs> you know, Mr. Chair, I would, yes. if I may, I was just going to um, say I got mine too, Todd. And what I liked about it was the number was very low and um, it's a spread over an entire year. So I thought, I thought we looked pretty good. <laughs> I don't live in the mansion you live in. <laughs> and I wasn't even talking absolute numbers. I was just curious to look at the percentage because of how we did it. And, I, and I'm in the county too, so the, the county gets to be my number one. So then schools and then uh, fire and rescue and then college. Jody, go ahead. Okay. I also wanted to point out, starting on page 19, is the financial statements of the foundation. Uh, because they are a component unit for the college, their financial statements are included here. We do not audit them, but they are required to be in this uh, financial statement. So from that, starting on page 19, those are the financial statements of the foundation. So within the footnotes themselves, nothing changed 
from this year compared to prior years. So I was going to breeze past the, the footnotes unless someone has a specific question in the footnotes. We did go over a couple of them in detail with Trustee Wood. But. Any other questions? Does that complete your report, Joe? No, but I got two more letters that I want to point out. So if you go all the way back to page 57. What number? Page 57. Okay. This is where, this is our letter on internal control. So if we would have had a finding in the internal control structure here, this is where we would have reported it. Uh, we did not have a finding in internal control. This is answering my question about the deficiency letter, yep. correct? Yep. Question, do you survey uh, the staff members in terms of um, likelihood of fraud or anything like that? Any we do make an inquiry of uh, staff and management okay. about fraud, fraud specifically. Okay. And we do perform what we call walkthroughs of key control so we identify some of the key areas and the key control in that area and we will perform a walkthrough to see that control in in working order mr. chair yes, I again I had the opportunity to talk to Jody earlier and um, this particular letter was wonderful to see I think I was asking Sarah how many years in a row now that we've managed to go with no findings in an audit which says a lot about the operations here at NIC and the quality of people we have doing it. So thank you to you and Chris and all of your staff. Um, this is a big deal to not have a finding. Congratulations. So how many years has it been? It, what we said at least. A lot. <laughs> it, there was like three or four, and then before that, like six or seven. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so you our, our next letter on the. On before you move away oh, from sorry. that one, Jody, let me ask. Um, the last paragraph on page 57, um, you indicate that uh, you did not identify any deficiencies in internal control and consider that you consider to be material weaknesses. And that's great news. But the next sentence says, however, <laughs> material weaknesses may exist that have not been identified. And my question is, do you have any suggestions for us that we should look at or explore in order to see if there are any weaknesses that weren't uh, part of your audit you know there, there's always the option of um, having hiring someone to come in and perform a in-depth review of your internal control um, both you know you can do one inside or you're in your IT department so all the controls over your um, security systems and cybersecurity and that and then also the internal controls you know functioning in your accounting and financial aid and, and all those places so there are in-depth studies that you could do and that's what they focus on is your controls or your IT mr. chair in that context is that more of what we would call a forensic audit something like that uh, yeah probably maybe but sometimes you can you can just get an internal control review and so they're not necessarily looking for fraud or misappropriation of assets they're just looking at the controls you have in place making sure they're solid making sure they're being followed um, because just because you have a control doesn't mean the staff is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and then um, it can also involve are you using your software to the extent you should be using it and using it the right way and then all the way to your IT security and are there holes there where the college um, has some risk because of security controls Thank you. Judy. sir and thinking that through uh, do we have any history of ever having done any depth in-depth uh, analysis of any of our areas and I know both Chris and Sarah are newer so from an IT perspective Ken Wardinsky and his his group have been very aggressive at following the new standards that have come out from the governor's office the state is putting forward and and we are going through um, a process to really go through our IT internal controls right now, making sure that we're we're solid there. Um, and we expect we may find some areas that we need to address through that process is what we'd hope to find. But IT specifically has been our focus recently. And then from an, another layer of internal control, Sarah and I also are very engaged in 
um, each department on campus specifically that deals with financial issues and, and making sure that they're following our process and, and trying to do audits of those, uh, specifically with cash and, and PCI and credit cards at the moment have been our focus. And, and thank you because it, I think we're all aware of the cybersecurity issues uh, and so I'm glad that's on the top of your list. Uh, but it doesn't mean we aren't monitoring. Over the years we've worried about and paid attention to some of our auxiliary groups and how they're doing and cash is such a temptation. So thank you for the update and sharp eyes. Absolutely. Uh, Chair Howard, if I can also just share about the auxiliary groups, as, as part of our federal funds that uh, Jody's going to speak about in a moment, we rotate through those so that I. Bailey's also doing a review of those auxiliary groups on a rotating basis. Different ones, different times. Absolutely. Uh, Chris, before you sit down, the reason I asked the question about um, this comment, uh, material weaknesses may exist that have not been identified, it's always, I suspect, a question of you may be doing enough internally to try and, you know, keep up with those. Sometimes it's of some assistance to ask for a third party to come in and just sort of fresh eyes looking Absolutely. at it so that uh, you can discover any material weaknesses, as it says in the report. And I don't know if we're at a point where that makes sense or, and I'd, I'd like to have somebody comment on it to see whether, you know, maybe that's something that needs to wait for another day or is it something that uh, we should do periodically? Uh, have a third set of eyes. Sure, Howard, I, I would agree that we would welcome the, the periodic review of that. That was one of the, the primary emphases for us changing audit firms. Um, when we did, we went out for RFP. Uh, we looked at the process there because our prior audit firm had been with us for so long. Um, they did a great job, but they were so used to seeing our operation. That was one of the emphases for trying to change um, the view that we get on a regular basis. But there's apparently an area that has, is not looked at in an ordinary audit that is accept, accepted by this last sentence, material weaknesses may exist that have not been identified because it's not designed to identify all the def deficiencies. That is correct. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering, do you have an, any opinion as to whether or not we might need to have an outside evaluation of whatever wasn't evaluated this time? I, I would welcome that, and um, I think on a regular basis, that, that's a good idea that we should bring in third parties to look at that. Uh, this statement, if, if I may, is, is uh, accounting speak for, we looked at everything, we might have missed something, and we want you to know, we tried to, we tried and we did our job, but there may be things that we didn't discover. And, and I, I can quite frankly appreciate that it, it, <laughs> it's, we, we did the best job we could based upon what we were provided, mm -hmm. and but, because there is a but, uh, that maybe we ought to think about is there something we need to look at and I guess we need some advice as to whether or not that needs to be done and if so maybe how often maybe we can address that at another time but uh, th that's the question that comes to my mind is if we don't have anybody evaluating that in the normal audit should we ask for it to be done every four or five years as a special kind aspect of an audit or whatever? I do think that's a best practice, and we're happy to look at that and, and come back with a recommendation there. Yeah, and, I, and I would add that uh, putting in place a strong internal audit, uh, regular, that doesn't involve an outside party, that just to have internal um, audit practices that are regularly um, uh, in motion is a, another piece of that. So we'll, let, we should talk about that. Absolutely. Thank you. Jody? All right. Uh, so the, the next letter starting on page 59 is the letter to address our audit of the federal awards. And like Chris said, we, we do come in and um, test those. We test your student financial, financial aid every year because that's a really large award. And the Department of Education has told us that we need to audit it every year. And then we do rotate in some of the other big programs that you have. So this year we rotated in the um, aging cluster, and so that one was audited this year. Um, my guess is next year we'll, we'll rotate in another one of the big ones and audit that as well. So this year it was the aging uh, uh, federal award and the student financial aid that we audited. Which two uh, were they? Aging and what? Student financial aid. So if you want to look at what your federal awards were for the year, they start on page 61 and it's about two and a half pages worth of federal programs. And so, um, I don't have my glasses with me, but I think that says 21 million, 21.8 million <laughs> in federal awards this year. And of course, half of that is your student financial aid. 
And then we did have a couple of findings in the student financial aid, which is very common uh, among that program. It's very compliance intensive, and when you're dealing with a lot of students and student data, um, it's pretty normal for us to find some discrepancies in um, student, some of the student data that gets reported to NSLDS. Um, they weren't significant enough that we called them a compliance finding, uh, but just recommend that some controls be strengthened to make sure that the, these discrepancies are caught. So that's, uh, that's in the letter for the um, federal awards. And that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Mr. Chair. Chris, yes, Chris. Yeah, uh, um, Jody, I wondered if you would clarify or maybe Chris could clarify that in those compliance um, that you came up with, it actually ended up being just one. Is that correct? Right. So one of the ones that we tested um, had some discrepancies with th what was reported on NSLDS, and then there was one change a, st a student changed majors, and that affected um, the student financial aid piece, and so that was something else that was missed. Um, so those are being reported as control, a control deficiency, but not a compliance deficiency. So, so you had indicated that there were, I mean, there was a fairly minor finding of noncompliance that you didn't even consider noncompliance, but you also suggested something about strengthening the just the controls over it the reporting to um, you know to catch these errors before they uh, get get finalized yeah. and that's a general statement but i guess chris is that have those if you determine what needs to be done to strengthen the controls we have we provide a recommendation a uh, response to this recommendation back to the auditors to explain what our process is going to be to to try to clarify that uh, our financial aid department does an outstanding job and we've made big improvements the last several years and these are um, refinements of those, those prior findings. And so we're still working on those, but a big part of it is just they have in place double checks to ensure that what we're putting forth before it gets into NSLDS is correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, Judy? And that's, that's good follow up because I remember last year we talked about needing to be more thorough, and we're getting there. We're down, we're down to one this year. So that's a. <laughs> The right way to go. Good win. for you. Thank you. Then my only other question had to do, I think it's just me, you happen to be missing page 27 and 28 of our uh, audit report. So if all the other board members have it, that's important, so most of us have seen it. Because on those pages were the notes, and that's of course one of the things you'll go read fast is what the notes are about. Um, and so I didn't see notes three and four, but if others have, that's fine. My only other question was on page 26 where it talks about note two. Then I went back a ways and did not find notes one. Or a note. And you single. got a really bad draft. I'm sorry? <laughs> you got a really bad draft. <laughs> Should I take that personally? <laughs> no. <laughs> so we will get you a revised copy of this. Well, with, more with importantly, the all the other board members saw it well enough to be sure we're okay. Note That's one that. is at the top of page 21. Page 21. <laughs> My pages are all here. Did anybody else? Oh, yeah. have them? Hang on. Okay. I double checked. I thought maybe I missed the miss. Note one. <laughs> yep. yep. Good. Thank you. So it was really the only issue then was page 27 and 28. As long as that's covered, thank you. Thanks for sharing. How strange is that? Any other thank questions you. or uh, Jody? Yes. I'd make a motion, if I may. Yeah, I'd like, just okay. Sure. Just, did that complete your report then? Yes. I'm okay. Go ahead, Christy. Mr. Do. Chair, I make a motion to accept the NIC financial audit for year ending June 30th, 2017. I'll second that. Or second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank Accepted. you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may, them. I just would like to highlight uh, Sarah Garcia's work on this. She does a yep. fantastic job. And if you'll remember several years ago, we were not preparing our own financial statements. And that's a big, big push. And she's done an outstanding job. And her and her team, I'd just like to note the work they do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's right. Is that a stand and go? <laughs> Good job. All right. Our next agenda item is our special report tonight on the Co-Creation Center. And uh, Cassie and Ryan. As Ka as so Jody, we hope you have a good, bo boring, Cassie. dull flight. <laughs> uh, 
turn it over to Cassie in just a second, and I just wanted to set it up. She's going to go ahead and introduce Ryan, and, and I'm not going to say too much because uh, we've got a, a nice presentation for you. Uh, but this really predates my arrival to North Idaho College. As you know, we received an Avista grant uh, a few years back. We built a four-course entrepreneurship track uh, that's evolved and, and really uh, been strengthened and connected to the business degree program. And we have other programs that are accessing that as well. But early on, and we're going to have a little bit about Gizmo and, and some of those things. And but early on, we be we asked the question: if if we believe that uh, innovation and entrepreneurship are or should be uh, key pillars in a in any region's economic development uh, strategy, then what should a community college, specifically North Idaho College's role, be in supporting that? And so. Um, to help us answer that question, uh, we brought on bar board uh, first in a more of a part-time role, but uh, that's since changed to a full-time role, uh, Ryan Arnold, and uh, asked him to help us think through, to guide our thinking through this. And, and we've had several meetings, and a lot of folks have been involved in this, uh, to determine, okay, what are the values of, as we get into this work? What does that look like? What are the goals? What are we pursuing here? And I, I think... Uh, you know, we're well underway. I think it's a good time for the board to hear about this work. Uh, there have been, I'm getting a lot of questions from the community, and we want to make sure we got it out in front of you before we got too far out into the community. So, Cassie, I'll turn it over to you to introduce Ryan. Oh, thank you, uh, President McLennan, and good evening, uh, Chairman Howard and trustee members, distinguished guests. I am very excited to be standing here tonight to introduce Mr. Ryan Arnold. This has been a passion of mine for many years to see innovation and an entrepreneurial spirit come to our campus and I think we have the right gentleman uh, sitting at the helm uh, helping us figure this out so I don't know if Ryan will tell you much about himself but I wanted to brag a little bit that he's a local Coeur d'Alene uh, young man from one of our local high schools who went off and uh, um, made his way in the world and and got degrees and an MBA at Bain, Brain, Brain, uh, can you say it? Bain Bridge <laughs> Graduate Institute. He's been an entrepreneur himself and he was uh, one of the original co-founders of Innovative Collective here in town, as well as a director of Startup Spokane. And he had a lot to do with the development and the implementation of that model over in Spokane, which has been highly successful integrating with uh, the community colleges over there in the community. So um, very appropriate and, and very pleased and honored that Ryan agreed to join our team and lead us in this effort. And I think you're going to be really excited about uh, what he's about uh, to show all of you. So I'm going to turn it over to Ryan and I want to stand here because the speaker's are Perfect. Good. Thank you, Cassie. Mm -hmm. Chairman Howard, members of the board, President McLennan, uh, distinguished guests, faculty and staff, thank you. Uh, it's exciting. We've been working on this idea of entrepreneurship and innovation long before I got here, but the idea of the co-creation center and sort of the follow-up of how we package this vision together, and I think it's time to kind of get it out of the gate and share it with you all. So thank you for having me this evening. Uh, Cassie went through kind of who I am, my business background, entrepreneurship, actually a bit of sustainability. I worked in the engineering field for a while. Uh, founder of two local companies, had an early role in Innovation Collective and founding that here in Coeur d'Alene and was the previous director of Startup Spokane at the very early stage. Uh, I had the opportunity sort of to expat myself over to Spokane for a few years, and I've been over there building a program that focuses on helping entrepreneurs and building community and organizing the assets we have there um, to better serve our community around entrepreneurship. So it's been a pleasure to kind of come back and then work here in my hometown again to work on this vision. So I start with a quotation to kind of get us going about why we're talking about this. And it's, the entrepreneur always searches for change, responds to it, and exploits it as an opportunity. And as entrepreneurs in the room here, that's what we're doing. There's change that we all face. Um, we react as a higher, higher ed institution to some of the workforce demands, the economic demands. Uh, so what I get really jazzed about is startup and, and small business. Um, that's really the bedrock of our community. And if we look, 96% of small businesses in the U.S. are under 50 employees. And in Kootenai County, 64% of our local payroll is five employees or less as far as organizations. So this is really, I think, a dramatic shift over the last 20 or 30 years about when we talk about supporting businesses, the realization that small business counts, especially in communities like here in Coeur d'Alene. 
So again, startups and small businesses, they provide the economic engine. These are where jobs grow. Big businesses have their role, but entrepreneurship and small businesses is where actually new jobs are created here. So when we talk about workforce development, economies, and what our role is, this is where we focus. Um, we've heard it all. You know, the future of work, things are changing, AI, robotics, software. And whether you believe exactly these stats or not, uh, the trend is clear. So 47% of current jobs in the next 20 years will change or be wiped out. Um, that's a scary trend just to even look at, whether we're off 10% or not. And with that, the gig economy, the changing economy of how we do work, um, the gig economy is 34% of our workforce. So that being defined as um, a 1099 worker or someone or contract work or even moonlighting under a different career. So again, what are we teaching here at NIC as far as skill sets if the workforce looks like this in the future? If it's changing, if it's a place where you have to make your own and it's no longer a place where you're a W-2 worker, but you're your own entrepreneur no matter what you're doing. And so what do we do here to react to that? And then finally, this entrepreneur gap I talk about, the idea that millennials are the highest educated workforce and yet they're the least likely to launch a company. A lot of facts behind why that might be, but how do we change that dynamic if we're focused on economies and workforce? And finally, we feel the change. This is not new to us here in this room. Higher education is changing, not only because of those workforce and economic demands, but because we're changing too. Technology is changing how higher education is delivered. So when we talk about degrees changing to badges, this need-based a la carte system, on demand anywhere, how do we change and how do we adapt and deliver differently? Um, we know that information is free. You can watch a YouTube video as far as that one directional um, delivery. How do we change what a campus means now that that is something that's free out there in the world? So we see the trends. We see how other organizations change. Um, we talk about the maker movement. We talk about ex experiential learning. We talk about project-based learning and this idea of the innovation campus. And we see the headlines and we learn from that. What's happening around the U.S.? Cassie uh, Silvis, myself, and Dana Moore had the chance to go to the NACI conference, the National Association of Community College Entrepreneurship uh, down in Tampa. And we had the ability to learn from our peers what other community colleges are doing across the U.S. And there's great examples we'll kind of showcase and roll into about how we think we can do it here. But when we look regionally, University of Idaho and their IRIC building, it's really focused on cross-discipline learning, putting a lot of different components in one building and building systems so they can react together. We look at Boise State and when we talk to them, the idea of the College of Innovation Design and their focus is on faculty-driven innovation. How does faculty innovate here at NIC? How do they change programs and adapt themselves? And then finally, Gonzaga University and their new venture lab they're really focused on community student collaboration, so that mission-driven learning and how do they engage with the community and build assets. So no matter what the programs, the trends, you know, what are we looking at, what are our peers doing, and how do we adapt? Um, really it becomes an education-focused sandbox. We talked about experiential learning, cross-discipline learning, campus-wide entrepreneurship. And that idea, I think, is really unique. The idea that we train skill sets here. We train for being a culinary artist, we train to be a welder, all of those things, no matter what we train for, at the end of the day, they're still fo focusing, or they're still in the same place of that workforce uh, trend of they're gonna have to make their own way. So how do we train for entrepreneurship? How do we train so they have the soft skill sets so they can react in the workforce after they leave NIC? And so that's what we call the work-ready, future-ready outcomes, critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, the three C's. So, in the new world of all this accelerating change, are we preparing our students? And my reaction is yes. I think we're doing some really great things here. Um, it's a pleasure to walk into this uh, community and uh, this institution and to see all the great things that are happening here. And I think we can do so much more. And that's the really exciting part. And that's what kind of rolls us into this idea of the co-creation center. So for those that haven't heard the word co-creation before, it's a pretty new word, but it's the form of innovation strategy that takes aim to develop all these mutually and different ideas, businesses and opportunities around all the different backgrounds and around a common goal. 
So for us, what we define the co-creation center to be is a place to learn, obviously, because we're student oriented, but to build and to connect. And around that, to also celebrate all this creativity and innovation entrepreneurship that can happen here. And I think that's important. No matter how we deliver education, how do we celebrate it? How do we build momentum and build community here on campus and connect to the outside community as well? So again, our goal is to provide NIC students with those adaptive skills, those three C's we talked about, uh, to leverage shared campus space, and we'll get into what space looks like, uh, to amplify the existing programs we here, have here on campus. And I think that's really unique. We have some really exciting programs that are happening here in partnerships. And then develop those new programs, the things that can take us to the next level. When I look at what NIC has, and when I you know, take just take a look at all the things that we're doing here, uh, the existing courses and programs and partnerships um, really set us up for success. When we look at our community, um, Cassie, myself, and Dana again down in Tampa talking to our peers, a lot of them are doing similar things to what we hope to do here, but they felt alone. They're in communities that don't have anything else. They know that they have to drive innovation and they have to change, but they don't have partners like we have here in Coeur d'Alene. So I think it's a really unique opportunity where we can not only be this epicenter, but we can help drive everybody else's uh, partnerships as well. And then finally, the Legacy Workforce Facility. Um, I, I say it's prime for 21st century retooling, but I think it's a really unique opportunity we have here that other campuses that we talk to, they don't have things like this. They have to build from scratch, and we have this all right here. So when we build out and talk about the building blocks of success, Yes, we teach business skills, and yes, we teach entrepreneurship as a certificate, and those are great examples. But what I really like is the idea that we have business resources and support that are already here and exist, but we haven't really aligned them. So when we talk to an entrepreneur or the community or the students, how do they plug into Career Services and then follow up with Small Business Development Center? You know, Career Services touches over 2,000 people a year, helping them find their pathway. But what I hope to provide is the entrepreneurship assistance, that zero to one, for when a person or a student or a community member has an idea, how do we get them through the crux to the next level? And the next level is Bill over at Small Business Development Center to help them with mentorship and guidance, and we have that under our roof now. And then when we talk about 21st century, the library's focused on changing too, right? So when they look at their models, and they're pulling from all over the, the area as well, their focus now is one of many is the business research initiatives they have there. So how do we pull from that and surround our entrepreneurs and students with all these things at the same time? When we talk about creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship, it comes from making. It comes from developing things from nothing. And so the programs we have here do that. Um, we teach you know, engineering and industrial arts and fine arts, and they all have a place in creativity and innovation. And we have this partnership with Gizmo Coeur d'Alene because of the leadership here and the vision. And that's something that's really unique and special, and I think will lead into some of the great things we hope to do here. Uh, culinary arts, mechatronics, the engineering and student clubs here um, are all examples of great things. But the digital creativity and innovation I think is exciting. Computer science and our partnership with the University of Idaho. Graphic and web design and the students that are winning awards as of last weekend over in startup competitions. Uh, computer and IT and our technology and CS clubs here in town. All examples of great things. But how do they align? How do they link together? I mentioned community. I won't dive into it because I think we're all community members and are well aware of all the great things that happen here. But from higher ed to business to the community partners like Innovation Collective, Emerge CDA, they're all doing great things. But how do they connect to NIC under this one umbrella of innovation? And finally, the hub, the space, the opportunity that I think we all see. Um, I mentioned other schools. This space has high bays and service drops, which is really unique, something we can really utilize for technical and flexible spaces when we talk about gizmo or other things in the future. And again, the community and student-oriented access, it has a unique position on campus that allows people to park there and to access from one side or the other, um, an advantage to us. But what I really like is, I spent the summer in the Headland Building, and it's pretty quiet there during the summer, um, but we still give student tours for potential students. And I think the story I always heard every day walking through is the story of Headland Building, which was, this is a place where things used to happen, and places where 
we used to you know build things here and you can have lunch upstairs two days a week right it's sort of that was the story that we tell ourselves about headland now and when i talk to students on campus it's the place on the other side of campus it's a place we don't go um, and we need to change that it's highest and best use how do we utilize our campus and i think headland is a great opportunity for us to take that on so this is not about what we are going to do in a nice bow and a package. It's about what progress we've made and where we're going. Um, before I got here, because of the leadership and the vision, Small Business Development Center is moving into Headland Building from Post Falls. So having Bill Jung there is going to be fantastic. Gizmo Coeur d'Alene, that partnership that we established being in that building is exciting. I've twisted Dana Moore's arm to move his office at least over to Headland Building. So the two guys with entrepreneurship titles sit in the same room. Um, that's exciting. And then removing myself from this position and just saying as a community member, it's really exciting that NIC has taken on the responsibility and the challenge to hire somebody to push vision around entrepreneurship here. I'm excited to do it personally. So when we look at all of that and then we talk about all the partnerships and all the things that we do here on campus, we have this idea of the Collab Lab, this first vision of a space that sits next to Gizmo. So what is the Collab Lab? For us, it's the Creative Commons, um, a place where all NIC students, faculty, and community members can find a way and an entry point to engage. And that's where we need to start building those engagement points. Um, this is a defined space for applied learning and creativity and innovation. So it has a brand and identity around this building and around the space, but all people are welcome there. And at the end of the day, we hope to produce new ideas and new businesses and with that support model we have, wrap them with that support. SBDC being in the building, entrepreneurship being in the building, the library providing services in the building are all examples of one-stop shop for our community and our students. And this is the first iterative step of how we can start taking these progressive steps towards making Headland something other than the place it used to be. So a lot of words, but what does that mean? What do we do there? Um, we don't have the full vision because the full vision comes from the community. It comes from partnerships and it comes from iterations. We treat this like a startup. We don't design it all and then launch it and then fail. We do small bits. So what I call this is the plus 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 model. The idea that we can do gizmo plus computer science plus industrial design in a community and design something like a prototype lab where a community member can come in with a 3D printer, a student, and some time with our business services and build a business prototype. We can do something like the campus curriculum incubator, something we've seen at Boise State where, where our faculty can come in and design new programs and test them here. Um, service Learning Academy so we can launch new business ideas, robotics lab, beverage arts lab, virtual reality lab, these are all things that we have the partnerships and the resources to do and then some. So the iteration we see this is first step. This is already in the agreement with Gizmo for them to move into a space and then for us to expand and to envision. And so this is what we work on together in the future. And we iterate, we build new programs, we create functions for people to work and interact, and then we test it with students and we do it again. And we build and we grow. My role um, beyond giving presentations to the, the board um, is really beyond this pitch and this vision is to start building the community and start building the connections. Um, this is not a, a one-man shop. This is something that everybody needs to get on board with and build together. And so that's my role and responsibility. In the end, I, you know, looking at it all, I think we have the programming, we have the space, we have the people here on campus and the community. What we really have is the opportunity to make something greater than the sum of all of its parts. And I think that's the important example of all these things coming together at the right place and right time. So thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Uh, at the pleasure of the board, I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments from the board? <coughs> I'm not sure I can formulate a question. I'm a little right. overwhelmed. I, 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 I like the, the vision, but I, I, I don't understand all the vision. I, I guess I wonder how, when you're building community, have, are you already interfacing with the students on campus and the programs that already exist on campus that could take advantage of a maker space. I think experiential learning is the way to get kids and people thinking critically, problem solving, all those key things by doing and then 
once you fail, you find a different way to do it. Right. I know you can go out into the community and pull people in, but I guess I don't see, I, I don't understand your role in getting students in there and, and getting faculty to come over and say, hey, I could put something into one of my units that requires our students to come over here and use that space. Is that even close to what you're thinking, or is, mm -hmm. or did I just misunderstand oh, the I, whole presentation? Uh, Chairman Howard and Trustee Murray, um, I, I think you understand it correctly. And again, to point, that this is a process, that it's, it's not completely shaped, because for this campus and many, these are new ideas and these are new structures and we, we push the limit a little bit to how we innovate here on campus by doing so. My vision is to build the machine that allows these different programs and machines to be made, right? So to, build, to build the proper structures and interfaces appropriately and my job um, in the past into here has been to reach out to all sorts of community members and engage and try to figure out um, from students to faculty uh, to program managers, how this would work for them or what they need and how we can function in this building together. So if that answers your question, it's, it's a messy process. I, I think it's an exciting uh, addition. I Thank just you. think this is a cool thing and a nice way to go. <laughs> Christine. Yeah, and I really just a comment because you really covered everything. It's mm -hmm. hard to come up with a, a your question was good, <laughs> um, but it's very exciting because the board did talk about this at least three or four years ago. We didn't really know what we were talking about, <laughs> but we knew we wanted something like this. And so it'll be really great to watch it evolve if you, as you've promised it's going to. We're going to hold you to that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's exciting. So thank you, Ryan. Good work. Thank you. Um, Ryan, I have a, <clears throat> a question, I suspect, but in the beginning of your slide presentation, you indicated that U of I, um, Boise State, and Gonzaga were programs that you looked at. And uh, if I understand what you, how you characterize them, you indicated that each one of them had kind of a focus. U of I was kind of a cross-discipline, and BSU was a faculty-centric uh, program, and Gonzaga was more student something. Um, and I, I, I understand your, your discussion to us today that this is an evolving process and program, but how, how do you see our focus now, just generally? I mean, these other programs have got a focus. Are, are we going to be everything to everybody, or are we going to try and, and develop areas um, that we're going to be able to succeed in because we have the resources and, and the ability to do it? Chairman Howard, thank you for the question and a great one. Um, I think for simplification of the slides, um, that's a simplification of exactly what each one of those programs does at the University of Idaho, Gonzaga, and Boise State. Um, I think they t take a much bigger role in general, but uh, sort of boxing, I think, what their core is. For us, um, I think the unique opportunity is the maker space and the building itself, the, the ability to make things here and then to collaborate with the community. Um, whether that gives us too wide of a range, I think it's yet to be seen. Um, we're working on it. Thank you. Let me just add President, one thing please. to that. You know, one of the, connecting this is, to our mission has been really critical to this whole conversation. And so one of the aspects of this isn't necessarily to be all things to all people, but it is to provide broad, open access to the kinds of learning and programs and services that focus on uh, developing people wherever they are on the spectrum of understanding, uh, the, you know, how to how to break down innovation and entrepreneurship and access the uh, a whole lot of resources in this community that aren't going to be on our campus. So part of it is part of it is speaking broadly to our mission about open access and making this kind of learning accessible to more people than you're gonna see at the university level or in a more focused program. Yeah. Did, you, yeah, did you complete your answer before? I believe I have. Okay, Thank you. good. Judy? Just wanted to follow up, because I think, um, Dr. McLennan, you've, you've been involved in this kind of activity before with the uh, previous, and what did you see or learn there that you bring to us? Well, that would be another whole presentation, but I, what's been fun in working with Ryan and with Cassie and, and others is, we, I, I did have that experience, 
And we made a ton of mistakes along the way, and we learned a lot along the way, and it started to get pretty good, uh, you know, further into it. Ryan has a similar experience in, uh, you know, going down these roads and trying to figure out what's going to work, how do you engage communities, and uh, he's learned a ton uh, doing that as well. So I think for the two of us, being in this role together and trying to help to get this off the ground, we're pretty excited about, okay, let's see if the stuff that we've learned to get us to this point, given all these resources and the relationships that Ryan mentioned, we've got a wealth of opportunity here that we think that we can uh, capture. And, and again, you heard it from Ryan, I won't, won't repeat all that. Um, but specifically, I, it, it would be too much to say, do this, don't do that. But there's a lot there. Um, Another question I had, Ryan, I, I was impressed with the one graphic that you put up there that 64% of the local payroll are businesses of five or less employees. And so that's an audience, uh, obviously, for us. Um, and um, I, we're challenged, I suspect, to make sure that the other 36% were offering services to them also. But they, almost by definition, have the resources to, to develop their businesses because they're larger. And when I saw your graphic that you, one of the suggestions was a service, a learning academy as one component. And, and so I, I guess I'm wondering, are we going to try and design this to focus on uh, the local payroll, uh, the local businesses, um, and help them with their entrepreneurial um, growth? Because um, that seems to be a fairly large audience for us. Sure. Uh, Chairman Howard, thank you for the question. Um, my focus first is, you know, providing students with the education they need and what I think the future of their workforce needs are. Um, being said, I, I think that absolutely business plays a role in our support services that we have here. Um, being able to open that to the community is a definite role because it not only helps economic growth for those small businesses, but I think it helps integrate our students into the business community and I think that's a, a dual win for us. Just on a follow-up to that, I would really think that in conjunction or concert with the uh, Workforce Development Center, some of that specialized training would be done there. And it might be much different than what I could see here with innovation, creating new opportunities and maybe new industries within uh, our communities. And, you know, we could, we could really be a leader in, in that direction, but not forgetting that we have credible Workforce Development Center located out in Post Falls, which also is at the Idaho Research Park, which incubates other types of businesses. So it's really a, a great time in our That's community. Cool. So this would be cool. Any other comments? Ryan and Cassie? Cassie, do you have something to add to this? I do have one thing. I just want to thank you, Ryan. Yeah, thank he's, you. he's amazing. I just wanted to uh, recognize Lita's leadership. She's pulled together a meeting Monday that's going to occur with Gizmo and Ryan being there inviting the faculty and students and the community to come in and hear a little bit more about this and be able to have more directed questions towards Ryan and Gizmo about what we're doing and, and the future of all this. So, Just to follow up on that thing, Kathy, it sounds like part of what we'll be doing is outreach not only to students here but the Chamber of Commerce and other groups that are, are uh, fostering that kind of businesses that are here and businesses that we want to come here as well. Great. Thank you. Ryan, thank you again. It's it's nice to hear that we can steal talent from over in Spokane. <laughs> uh, we do that on a regular basis. Um, and uh, we always turn out good products like you. Thanks for calling me talent. I appreciate Thanks. it. <laughs> All right. Our next uh, agenda items are the constituent reports. ASNIC, Caleb Weeks. Thank you, Chairman Howard, Board, President's Cabinet, faculty, staff, and other guests. Um, it's only been a few weeks since our last meeting, so I don't have too much to report on. Starting off, Senator Allison Alberton has submitted the Foundation Grant proposal for the 40 calculators for the College Skill Center. It took her a few months of work, and she had a lot of meetings and additional trainings to fill out the grant, but she did a very great job, and it was wonderful to read. I got to sign off on it, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with the grant. Um, we also had a student action item come in about 
a student who rides their bike year-round, so first off, kudos to them. That's pretty impressive. Um, he wanted covered bike racks on campus for at least one of the main buildings, and I gave this project to Senator Ben Anderson, and he's been doing great work, and he's been working with facilities, and so far, it looks like NAC is soon going to be getting a covered bike rack. So hopefully students who are able to bike can have a safe place to leave their bike from the elements. And also there's going to be additional security, cam security cameras because this individual also had problems with theft. And so it's great to see that we're watching out for our students and keeping their items clean and also secure. So it's great to hear. Um, up next, I would like to read a little statement from ASNIC about the compensation policy. Um, I'll just read it really quick. ASNIC would like to see a compromise happen, and we would like to see a formal decision be made to not only benefit our staff and faculty, but ultimately our students as well. We worry that these strained relationships between staff, faculty, and the board could harm our students regarding the compensation policy. ASNIC supports the resolution presented by staff and faculty in regards to the compensation policy in order to dissipate the atmosphere of insecurity. A current policy that supports security and predictability will support a mission, vision, and values. And that's all I have on that. And the last thing I have is a little statement about the Student Wellness Recreation Center. In September, ASNIC passed a resolution regarding the implementation of a committee for the Student Wellness Recreation Center in addressing the importance of allowing students who paid fees from fall 2015 to spring 2017 access to the Student Wellness Rec Center. ASNIC has initiated the process of structuring a committee much like SWAB, which is the Student Union Advisory Board, and they are in charge of the Student Union Building. But the process has been proven to be slow. We are hopeful that a committee will be formed to address our concerns before the ASNIC board meeting on November 28th. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Yes. Um, might be for you or, or Graydon here. On the bike rack, are we purchasing one, <laughs> which I'm assuming we want it soon, or are we asking our engineering people <laughs> to design it and then ship it over to the welding program to have them fabricate it? Chairman Howard, Trustee Murray, um, yes, we got a quote from I don't know what company, but they specialize in bike rack covers. And Senator Ben Anderson said it was about $17,000, which we don't have the most funding available for such an item. Um, there was talk of having a rest stop that facilities had for a bus stop. And it's kind of like a mini shack, but open on one side. And that's also been proposed, or also building one with the carpentry or welding program. We're looking Very at good. that as well. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, well, Caleb, I can tell you that the welding division made a wonderful bike rack for the city police department, so I highly recommend them. <laughs> uh, and you see others they've done around town. Uh, but I had a question on the um, Student Wellness Center and the committee. I didn't quite follow that. Um, so is a, a committee, maybe you could <laughs> tell, tell me again. <laughs> so you... Awesome. What is it that you're trying, that you're hoping to do or is to be done, and who's in charge of that? Maybe between you and Graydon, what's the issue? Yeah, so. Um, Maybe you see it one way and he sees it a different way. <laughs> Chairman Howard and Trustee Wood. The Student Wellness Recreation Center was funded partially by students. Yeah. And when it comes to a student funded building, we like to have advisory boards set up on behalf of students. We believe that when a building is funded for students, much like swab and also the dorms and it's funded by students we like to have student input and so oftentimes like swab and the dorm have their own which is consisting of the ras and paula and ty yes um it's students who get the main say and also kind of help advise hence the advisory committee for the building the main purpose is to really focus on students and address student concerns and needs that need to be addressed within the building and also outside entities that could be affected as well. Um, so I have been working with Jessica Bennett on this, and I got a little too, I got too much going on, and so I passed this on to Senator Ben Anderson as well. And so far we have been initiating communication with Jess and also 
grade in over here as well to get a committee going. And it has been taking some time, but we're still working on it, and we believe that one will get started soon. Okay, and then Mr. Chair. Yes. So Greg, do we normally have a student committee on student so. facilities? <laughs> Mr. Chairman and uh, Trustee Wood, we have a few that are already in existence, like Caleb was mentioning, like that Student Union Advisory Board. In fact, there are two or three that I've been talking about at President's Cabinet that we're in the midst of uh, formulating. One of those is student health and wellness. So as we've talked about our Student Health Center, we put together a committee of folks taking a look at what that will be like in the future with all those stakeholders from students to the nursing department to athletics to the residence hall, all those folks who are major stakeholders. The same same thing is true as we've had these conversations about the Student Wellness and Recreation Center was uh, we initially just had meetings between a few of us and then a decision was I believe mutually made that this would best be served by a, a committee of stakeholders for the group. So we initially put together a proposal, Caleb put together a proposal, and now we're blending those two. In fact, today Ben, who uh, Caleb was mentioning, one of the ASNIC centers, and Jess met today with anticipation that we'll probably be moving forward both of those committee proposals to PC next week. So as I mentioned to Caleb, our process isn't always necessarily known for quickness. Uh, but with all the stakeholders at the table. So I believe that we're on the, the right track and we've had a lot of dialogue together. And the committee will be balanced evenly with students and stakeholders? And well, I, which are the one and the same, <laughs> but I mean with students and faculty and staff. Uh, certainly, Chairman Howard and Trustee Wood. And I believe so. That's what we looked at uh, both on Student Health and Wellness and now Student Wellness and Recreation Center is we looked at those stakeholders to make sure there were students. I think in Caleb's proposal, there was a request that there be four students on that. I, I believe, but not to get into the particulars. Sure. We looked at a, a student who was an employee. We looked at a non-traditional student. We looked at a traditional age student. So we looked at uh, student representatives. Then we looked at the PE program. We looked at the athletic program. We looked at the recreation program. So just trying to make sure everybody who's a user or constituent group has some representation at the table. We believe by the time we're all done, there's there's equal kind of representation across the board that serves the facility or the program well. Great. Thank you. I, I take it that's a work in progress and we're going to hear more about it. Even though it's not a decision that's up to us, you're just going to let us know how you're working out things. Great. Yes, Chairman Howard, yes, Thank you. that's very true. Does that conclude your report then? Yes, it does. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Caleb. Thank you. <clears throat> Next report is Staff Assembly, Susie Dean. <clears throat> Good evening. So at the staff assembly meeting in November, we started off with a presentation by Teresa Borenpohl, who gave us an <coughs> overview of the new uh, enrollment process that they're looking at doing within the schools, where they're going out into the schools more. They have set days, and they're going to walk with the students through the process to engage them more in the process and also move the uh, assessment tests out into the schools, which I think is a great idea to, uh, so they don't have to come on campus to take those assessments. They can take them in the school. So I think that will help formulate a uh, stronger relationship, I would think, between the students and NIC. Then Nancy Edwards gave us an overview of the staff sabbatical policy and Gary Stark participated as the only one so far to avail themselves of the staff sabbatical policy. So they gave us more information on ideas of how it can be used. So we're hoping that we will have more staff that will step forward and, and take advantage of this opportunity. And then Teresa Henderson, who you are all very familiar with, last year's chair, uh, she gave us an overview on the current food basket collection for St. Asnick. So we've got boxes out in all of the buildings to collect the food and funds for that process. Then on the, uh, of course, the policy that doesn't go away, um, I do have a statement. The staff assembly would like to reiterate their support of compensation policy 3.02.16 as stated in the resolution presented last month we also want to express our support of the new faculty resolution, which the faculty chair will be sharing in his report momentarily. And I would like to close my report by wishing you all a happy Thanksgiving. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Our next report is Faculty Assembly, Jeff Carr. 
Thank you, Trustee Howard, trustees, President McLennan, distinguished guests and others. Uh, we met this month and we were visited by Vice Presidents Lita Burns and Chris Martins who gave us a brief update on outcome-based funding. We'd like to thank you for dropping by for a very interesting discussion. Uh, we also, once again, discussed the compensation structure policy and passed another resolution, which I'd like to read to you now. Whereas the faculty appreciates that nothing about the philosophy or the step system as stipulated in the drafts of the compensation policy currently before the board has substantively changed, we remain seriously concerned about the implementation of the policy. Removal of or failure to include stipulations regarding financial emergencies in favor of more ambiguous language would subvert the philosophical statements about the value of employees, fair and consistent pay policies, and effective and transparent compensation structures. Therefore, we ask that the board pass a policy that provides a clear commitment to the philosophical statements in the compensation policy by clearly defining financial emergency as the only condition under which funding of steps may be denied. By doing so, the board would create a truly transparent policy that accomplishes the policy stated goals of attracting, retaining, motivating, and rewarding employees through fair, transparent, and consistent pay practices. And that will conclude my report. Are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the next is Senate. Uh, Lisa. All right, Chair Howard, trustees, President McLennan, and guests. Senate, as schedules would have it, did not meet since last Board of Trustees meeting, so I have nothing to report to you. Um, tomorrow, I will say we have our November meeting, and we start looking through the seven remaining policies and procedures submitted by Information Technology to update our, uh, our policies that uh, we have currently. So we definitely have our work cut out for us after a pretty long rest with no new business. Thank you. Okay. Any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. President's report is the next agenda item. Thank you. I'm going to start my report by asking Sarah Garcia to change her hat from finance and audit to planning and uh, give the board a brief update on our integrated planning activities and to extend an invitation. Um, good evening, Chair Howard, board members and uh, staff, faculty, and guests. Um, thank you for giving me just five minutes. You'll have to excuse my voice. I feel much better than I sound tonight. Um, uh, my main purpose tonight is to invite you to um, the open house that we're, we have been holding open houses all week. We have our final open house tomorrow from 2 to 4 p.m. in the second floor of the Headland Building. It's on the end of the Headland Building that's closest to Sherman. Um, furthest away from the lake. What we're doing in our open house is sharing with um, the campus and, um, and interested parties what we've been doing since the convocation exercise that we did to discuss what people were hoping and wanting the college to look like in the future. So we have tables um, representing the different subcommittees that have been operating and doing really amazing work since um, September and kind of sharing that information with the campus. We had management team, our management team meeting in there on Tuesday morning and we were open today from noon to two o'clock and we had a nice steady flow of people who came in and got to see what's been happening and kind of hear a little bit about where we're headed next. So I would really like to extend that invitation to all of you as well. If you have availability and time, it's, it's quite impressive the amount of work that the committee's been able to do and the amount of participation we've gotten from the campus community. So that's, I don't want to take, I know it's a busy agenda tonight, so I don't want to take a lot of your time. Um, I do have a little bookmark for you. We have um, branded our process as Cultivate NIC, grounded in our mission and planning for our future. So I have a bookmark to share with you. There's actually a website that shares a lot of information about it. So if you would allow me, I'm going to just bring them up to you and then I'll allow the president hand it back over That'd to you. That'd be great. Office. I thought we were all reading off of computers now. Well, we're all reading off of computers now, so bookmarks. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have another commitment tomorrow. I can't do it. Yeah. Is it two to four? Thank you. Two to four. Yeah, I'm sorry. Library board meeting. <laughs> I'm never bored. <laughs> so, 
Thank you, sir. <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Trustee Meyer and Trustee Banducci for joining uh, us for the NIC Foundation Scholarship Dinner uh, last week. Uh, uh, it's really a fun event where we bring all of our many of our scholarship uh, givers and receivers uh, together, and they get to share uh, some conversation and a meal together. And we had two student speakers who just did uh, a terrific job. Very, very inspiring. I, I like the one young man who, uh, without any notes, got up there and gave a, a they both gave, did a terrific job. But um, he looked out at the crowd and he said, if they would have told me how many people <laughs> we're going to be <laughs> be here. I would have uh, I would have worried. Anyway, they did a great yeah. job. Um, I had the opportunity to speak to a crowd of almost 500 uh, K through 12 school board members and superintendents uh, from across the state of Idaho who were here in Coeur d'Alene attending the Idaho School Board Annual so Association meeting and. We did a small sponsorship for the, the convening lunch activity, and what that bought us was an opportunity for uh, me to uh, address the crowd for about uh, 10 minutes or so. And it was a good opportunity, and what I wanted to do, what I hoped to accomplish there was to uh, translate a little bit of the governor's task force recommendations and my involvement on the K-20 committee that was really focused on the pipeline and the pathway question, how we get people threaded through our two, our segments, in particular uh, high school uh, to secondary education, and that these pathways are very different than the pathways of the past, that they, we need to think about them differently, and, and to suggest and encourage them to engage in their communities with their local community colleges and others to uh, think of ways that they can collaborate together. We're certainly on, a, on the road to do that here in North Idaho. Uh, but North Idaho College can't do it alone, and the K-12 segment can't do it alone. Uh, really, the only way we're going to do this is we figure out how to do it together. And uh, it was just a real nice opportunity um, that was followed by a presentation, presentation from Linda Clark, a little more in-depth about the, uh, the task force. But it was a good opportunity to get that message out. And then we sat with the uh, local uh, 271 school board and, and had lunch with them. And uh, those relationships are forming a very... Uh, pleased to say. Uh, and then finally, I'll just end with uh, next week uh, on the 20th Monday, I'll be, uh, Laura will be joining me uh, heading down to Boise for the uh, ICCC, the, the Community College President uh, meeting. Um, and we've got a full agenda. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about the prioritization of the gover governor's task force, uh, some uh, specifically OBF and, and other things. Um, but it uh, should be a good meeting. I'll report back on that when I when I get back. Thank you. Any questions or comments on the President's report? Okay. The next uh, agenda item is a uh, election of officers. We're at that time of the year, <clears throat> excuse me, where we um, elect officers for the upcoming year. Three, three um, positions, the Chair, the Vice Chair, and the Secretary Treasurer. And so um, I would entertain uh, nominations for the position of Chair from the Board. Okay. For what? For the chair. Chair. Yes, Judy. Um, Mr. Chair, I'll make a nomination uh, for the chair for the next year, which would be Christy Wood. And that's not because you haven't done a good job. It's because you've served your time, and thank you for doing that. I think uh, uh, you would both have done a great job, and we'll give Christy a turn in the barrel. We need a second. Second. I second my own <laughs> I'll second. Okay. Thanks. So we have a second um, a nomination of Christy Wood for, for chair for the upcoming year and a second. Any discussion? Right. I, I would discuss, if, right. I, if I may. Um, I, would, I would echo what Judy has said, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate, I know what kind of a job it is. <laughs> I've done it. You're still willing to and um, I have more time now. Um, and you were gracious my first year of retirement and, and after that when I was dealing with the health of my mother, you were gracious to go ahead and take, continue on in that role. And so I do appreciate that and now I'm, I'm in a position where I do have more time. So I, I appreciate the vote of confidence, Judy, and I will serve you well if elected. <laughs> um, I, I guess I would make the comment too that, you know, this, 
the, the position of chair carries with it a lot of other responsibilities and a lot of other duties. And it is the kind of thing that we should move around from time to time. And uh, um, just because it, it is a real time consumer, and I think to get other members of the board in that position and uh, have them um, present at some of these other um, functions that we, that are so important, the Idaho, the Idaho um, Coalition of Community Colleges is an important function that the chair would uh, attend, and the chair is often the representative of the board on the foundation which meets every month. And so it's good to have a fresh face, I think, make sure that, get, that we get around and, and get new ideas and, and different people uh, in that position. So if there's any more discussion, all right, all in favor of the motion uh, to elect Christie as the chair for the upcoming year? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Now we got. We have uh, the next position is vice chair. That's the person who's in chair of, uh, in charge of vice. Yeah. Ed, okay. I'd nominate Ken Howard. Uh, actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to decline. I appreciate that. Um, but I really would like to see somebody else in that position, um, I, and I, I would like to just be a supportive trustee, quite frankly. Well, um, I, I, um, I would nominate Judy, but I think she'll decline. So um, I would predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Pre I will nominate Brad Murray for vice chair. I'll second that motion. Okay. Any discussion? <laughs> You're not going to reject my discussion me. piece. No, no, would, no discussion for me. <laughs> my discussion piece would only be that uh, I've been here a year in August, and I'm still learning. So that's right. We all You're are. You're a quick learner. <laughs> that's right. Welcome to the crowd. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. The next position is secretary treasurer. Looking Mr. for Chair? a nomination. Yes. I would nominate Todd Benducci for secretary treasurer. If you'll take it, Todd. Nope. I'm not interested. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm going to pass. I, I have. I'm not. I'm fine just to be a board member, trustee at large. I've got a lot going on with my business and other things. I may be going back on active reserve duty, lots of things. So I'm not interested in any additional duties. So I'm going to pass. Okay. I, I didn't hear it was a no. He he was a no. So um, I could, I will nominate you, and you could always you know. I've done See it how it goes, right, okay. Mr. Chair? I nominate Judy Meyer. Okay, a second. <laughs> second, <laughs> Brad. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we have three new officers. Christy Wood is the chair. Brad Murray is the vice chair, and the secretary treasurer is Judy Meyer. Uh, and since you're now the chair, you're welcome to continue this meeting. I make like. a motion. You finish out the meeting. Because <laughs> uh, the next. Not going away yet, Ken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because the next uh, agenda item is a compensation structure policy, um, 3.02.16. Um, where we left this the last time was there was a lot of discussion. There were uh, there have been several. Uh, um, suggestions made as to what the policy should be um, and so I'm going to open it up to the board to, uh, to continue that discussion. Mr. Chair, Christine. if I may, I would report back to you uh, the last meeting this board asked Trustee Murray and I to meet with President McLennan and come up with some additional um, proposal, a traditional proposal, and we, we did that. That was sent out to you. At this point, I would, I guess I would like to, to suggest that there are now four versions um, to look at, and then the original policy itself. And I think it would be prudent that we not dive into this tonight. I would really like to procedurally send it back to the president, ask him to review it, for input and the committee possibly. I think we all know exactly where we're having trouble with coming to consensus and I would say that's probably worried about advocating the um, authority of the Board of Trustees. And so I would ask, uh, I'm making a motion, 
that we send it back to the president, and ask him to focus on that area, and come back to us at a later date with with uh, another with I guess a a blending. Uh, a blending. A, a, a yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll second that motion. I'm trying to think procedurally. I guess without getting wrapped up in a bunch of procedural, we can go ahead and vote on that. But we've got motions on the floor too that. But this will take care of it. Okay. Yes. Todd. We had a motion and a second. Do we have discussion? Can I ask a question? Yes. I'm following what Christy's saying. We had the original, then we had the first two, and then we've had the fourth one. And the fourth one's a little bit of a um, blending of the original and a little bit of from the others, and even part of what was struck out was actually from one of the second and third version is not the original. But I also now have another policy in front of me that says it supersedes policy number 3.0701, and it is also numbered 3.02.16. So I now have an original and three additional versions potentially of 3.0216, and then I have a fifth that jumps out that's titled salary schedules versus compensation structure. So now I'm really confused how I ended up with two different policies of the same number but with different titles. Anybody want to help me with that one? Yeah, I really think the motion is that we send all of that information back <laughs> to the president and ask uh, for the policies to be reviewed in light of the suggestions in all of these policies as well as the discussion. And then can I ask one more question, sir? As I I have been a bit of an advocate, if you will, maybe even a bit of a champion for the part-time and adjunct faculty over the last number of years and the contract faculty, I know several, and trying to get a little bit of equal time for them and even inclusion in some of the increases in the salary structure. As I thumb through the thing that I'm looking at now, nine pages, may I encourage Dr. McLennan and those that are going to do this to, to equally look at those folks and their situation, not just the full-time slash tenured faculty. I, I think those folks have been getting the, sh the short end of the stick. And, and, and I'll give you one example. When it comes in here, it talks about a contact hour, if I could find it, but I believe they're being paid like $9 an hour. Well, if I have to drive from my house and I come here and there's a contact hour and I have to drive home and my gas and everything else, by the time I'm done at $9 for that class, I'm below minimum wage. And, you know, you have to have some modicum of, of experience and credential to be an instructor here at NIC. So, to me, we're, we're not compensating our adjunct and part-time people very good. And I, they really got to have a love for it. It's got to be a passion or a ministry to come and, and teach for, you know, and if they're under the... 15 hours, I think they get like, was it 335 bucks or something, there's some numbers. And Anyway, I, I guess I would look, we focus so much on the full-time and the tenured, and, and I can appreciate that to a point, but we're just so overweighted in, in our, in, in looking to the, no, that's not how I want to say it. I just think we're a little, uneven in our treatment of the folks that we have on this campus that are teaching our students. How about I say it that way? And I, I'd love for you guys to review a little bit that side of the house also, because we may get to whatever we want to call it, a, a, a current or anticipated or unanticipated or financial exigency. I didn't say that quite right, but the, or whatever. But at some point, adjunct and part-time are going to become a more important resource as they were as the different trends and cycles go on with our economy and our enrollment. And I just, thank you. I would appreciate that as part of the review. Judy. Thanks, Todd, because I think you've identified part of the reason that, that uh, I think I was the one that asked for the original policy to come back to us uh, this evening as well, because it seemed to me we, as I was studying these and looking through the four that we have, A, B, C, and D, and I thought, well, I'm not sure what we have originally. So thanks to Shannon, she dug that out. Because I think we need to weave all those together again. I think as we've discussed over the last couple of meetings, we're finding some common ground here. And there's still just a couple of sticky spots. And if, in fact, our good, wise president and colleagues can find some common ground with a few remaining pieces, we can cover all those bases that you've described uh, for compensation. 
and what role the board has at what point in dealing with that whole issue is part, I think, what the policies that we're needing can come about. So <clears throat> uh, I guess we're still back to the motion, so I appreciated Todd, uh, Todd's in, input into it, and I think that can be part of it. Thank you. Yes. So I just want to just add a little uh, to this conversation about the part-time and certainly the part-time faculty. Uh, I, you know, this by, by its nature is not that kind of a policy. It, it, is, uh, it is designed uh, to um, uh, place and uh, move full-time employees, not to uh, the, the points that you, you raise about part-time is very, I mean, that's, that's an important one. And so a couple things to think about that. We are doing our, this compensation study, and part of that will include uh, part-time faculty. On the part-time staff side, what we, we really don't have any structure at all right now. So to apply that to this would be really very difficult, but we are in the process of working through uh, a, a different way to classify part-time employees, make sure that there's some equity across positions, uh, and then uh, have the different sort of pay levels for different types of positions. Uh, we don't have that yet, but it is something, to your point, Trustee Banducci, it's something that we're aware of and are working on. It just would not become a part of this policy structure going forward. And Mr. Chair, and, and I would like to clarify on that too. It, it's not part of my motion because it, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. But I do agree with Todd. It could be a separate discussion item from, from, the, from this policy. And I agree with you. Let's look at adjunct because, um, you know, we made a statement on this campus mm, probably five, six years ago that we were always going to strive to be um, leaders in when it comes to we don't, we don't want low, low pay that people can't make a living. I mean, if it's snowing and suddenly I get a call and I need to be brought in as a substitute instructor, and I'm looking at paragraph four and it says academic instructors are compensated the rate of $9 per classroom contact hour. How motivated am I to want to leave my house in January at 10 degrees outside to show up to be a in substitute instructor for an hour? No. Uh, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't mean no, to. I don't want to get involved in a big discussion over something. We've got a motion yes, sir, to I'm return sorry. this to the president and, and the, the process. Uh, to um, uh, review the proposals that have been made. We've had like three meetings with discussions on these issues. We've had a workshop with these discussions. So we've had some written proposals and hopefully the, the totality of that will um, assist um, the president and the faculty and staff in um, making a proposal that hopefully we can, we can live with. So, uh, May I make one more statement really fast? Sure. Very fast. Some language that I saw in one of the drafts, I just want to point something out. If we want to talk about well, however you do it, I think it needs to say current or anticipated. The phrase was used anticipated and unanticipated. It's impossible to do something for something that's unanticipated. So, I think we used your language, Todd. No, no, <laughs> mine was current and anticipated. Oh, all right. Yeah, and okay. if you look at the draft, it says anticipated and unanticipated. Yeah. You Thank can't. You do something for an unanticipated event. I know we're wrapping this up, but I think it, the discussion reminds us again that what we're trying to do as a board is develop policy. And then the procedure and some of the other things that have been involved in it need to be separated out. And that's what we're headed for as a board, is to get that kind of policy that gives focus and then steps back and let the administration do what needs to be done. Okay, the motion is uh, to send this back to the president and the faculty and staff and the um, for their review and further um, suggestions and recommendations have been seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. It's back in your lap again. <laughs> well, and I, could I just make one little small point? So for everybody who's listening out there, uh, what that also means is that we're, uh, we'll continue to comply with our current yes. policy, mm -hmm. the policy that's on the books. It's not been disturbed by any motion or any. Correct. Vote of the board. Okay All right, Mr. I Chair, say something. Hang, hang on just a minute. Sorry. Yes, did you have a question there, Caleb? Um, just a brief comment. I want to make sure that whatever is decided upon that to make sure students are on the forefront of our minds because this feeling of uneasiness or being unsure for staff and faculty can really affect them and eventually, I believe, can encroach on NAC's mission, vision, and values, most notably student 
success and educational excellence. So just making sure that whatever comes to being and whatever is decided upon is fair and that everybody will have also equal opportunity and be treated fairly and equally and that nothing horribly too bad will come out of this. Thank you. And that's what we're struggling with, Caleb. Yes, did you have a, question, have a comment? With what's going back to them, we have the, what I want to call the four versions. Everything that we've talked about. And this additional new one tonight that's, also? That's the existing policy. Okay, but again, they've put the same policy numbers what we're working on, so now I have two different things. Right. So that's why I'm wondering if we're going to... All the versions that we have, as well as the existing policy, is being referred back. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, the next agenda item is Head Start Policy Council Bylaws, Beth Ann Fuller. Hey, there's the birthday girl. <laughs> Chairperson Wood, uh, board members, President McLennan, and guests, thank you for allowing me to request an approval of our carryover funds to approve our Head Start Policy Council bylaws and our Head Start ERSI policy and our Head Start criteria for prioritization and selection policy. So as part of this, this, the first piece with our request for a carryover to reprogram funds, um, there's a narrative that goes in with this request to the Office of Head Start. It needs to be approved in, and um, by both Policy Council and the Board, and Policy Council ha has approved it. The funds that were left over in our SF-425, which is our final report of our program year 2016-17 funding, was $67,500.42, which a major portion of that was some carryover, or not carryover, I'm sorry, but um, unfunded personnel and fringe, and also about 59 hundred dollars in carry over technical assistance and training dollars um, with our duration funding we were given both startup funding and some additional funding that will be ongoing to do uh, extended dosage and duration of our services for five of our classrooms the money um, frankly came in later than than anticipated and with internal hiring of different positions to get set up for duration for the 17-18 school year, we were not able to expend all the funds. And this is just um, an opportunity to ask that we be able to go ahead and carry them over into this year. And it would go into the Head Start Enterprise system as a request. And then they would look at that from a fiscal perspective at the Office of Head Start and make a decision about whether they would go ahead and just let us carry that money over into this year and use it for the same specific purposes that was meant to be used um, if we had had the money in time and um, some of the unfortunate events such as a few of our training events were, were actually um, canceled by the Office of Head Start because of other op priorities that were happening this last year but are now available to us for this calendar year. So that would be um, the first piece. And I appreciate that you allowed me to go to our uh, quarterly directors meeting and um, for the Idaho Head Start Association. And I really appreciate Chris Martin and Lorinda for being here with you last month to present the, the first reading of the Policy Council bylaws and also the ERSI policies and criteria. I'm open for any questions that anybody has. I'm, I'm a little confused, uh, Beth Ann. You want us to approve the carryover of $67,500. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion that you've uh, designed that we can do that? I mean, for, for what purposes and the, what are the conditions? I, I'm. I'm Sure. I, we need to have something specific that. to address. Within this tab, um, this, the discussion piece would be an approval 
of a request to carry over funds. The Policy Council approved the request for carryover at their September Policy Council meeting. The request is to be able to carry over $67,500 from budget year 2016-17 to um, from personnel and fringe and training to the 2017-2018 budget year. Are you reading from something? Yes. Oh, the blue page, sir. On the blue page. From our tab, from tab three. All right. I'm looking at the last page. The, oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. So, Mr. Chair, we, it's the first page after the yeah, tab. We need a motion then to uh, approve that. Mr. Chair, I'd make that motion to approve the, the carryover. I, I, at the same time, I would make, wrapped in that motion, the approval of attachment A, B, C, and D. Um, which we were the second reading we're at for the policies. That's my motion. Meyer seconds the motion. Okay, any discussion? Just, just a quick question. So the 67.5 was uh, a carryover because some of the uh, activities or programs were uh, taken off the table and those funds have come forward. And have you already identified the use of those funds in? the 1718 yes we have and we have submitted an entire training and technical assistance plan for the um, office of Head Start to review and decide if that meets their criteria okay so there's a motion in the second to approve the carryover as well as att the attachments a B C and D in the second and in the discussion phase, then, it helped me with the last sheet that, that Chairman Howard is holding up, explaining more about the, the request for carryover reprogram, essentially, sure. is what it said. Uh, so that, in fact, we are the fiscal oversight agency. It costs us no money either way. It's always an important part of our criteria here that this fund, advancing the funds, will help you better develop and assess what you're doing and develop the program in the future. And certainly you've, you've heard many times from this board how much we believe in the uh, hard work that you all do and the great need there is greater than we can all do but if this helps you do more have at it <laughs> so. Thank you. any further discussion uh, all in favor of the motion aye, aye. any opposed the motion carries unanimously all right does that conclude your presentation The, um, the next item is an item to reschedule a February board meeting. It's come to our attention last meeting that um, Trustee Murray will not be here the entire month of February. He's called away to an emergency vacation. <laughs> That's right. right? And, um, he needs to be retired. Yeah. <laughs> Trustee Meyer uh, will not be here part of much, much of that much month, of yeah. February. So the suggestion has been made that we reschedule it. And in looking at dates, it doesn't look like there's very many open date opportunities. So one option would be to cancel the February meeting completely. Trustee Howard. Yes. Uh, you did ask me to check, uh, and I did on, on our annual cycle of uh, things that come each month. Mm -hmm. There really is nothing in February if that were an option you wanted to consider. We may have some policy things that are up for a second reading, but they can certainly be pushed to uh, the following month. Okay. I mean, I, I, in my experience, and it's always valuable to have all the trustees here when we can. It aids in the discussion and aids in our understanding of what's going on. We don't have to repeat things, so and do Mr. we have a Chair, motion? Yeah. I would also say that we're just going to be coming back from Boise of spending a lot of time together, so I think it's fine to cancel the February meeting. I would make a motion to that effect. Is there a second? You ought to second it. Yes, sir. I'll second that. Second. Yeah, uh, it sounds from Dr. McLennan that it will not impact us operationally. So, uh, that's Trustee Andrews. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, all in favor? It's been motions been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? You, you're not opposed, are you, Brent? Uh, I apologize for having <laughs> to cancel the meeting. No, it's okay. Fine. You're welcome. You're probably all grateful. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> all right, so the February meeting is eliminated from the schedule. Um, the next agenda item is the board chair report. 
I have three items I want to report on this evening. Um, one is that uh, we have the Idaho um, Community College Consortium meeting on November 20th, um, which uh, President McClendon um, referred to earlier. And, um, and then there's a meeting on December 13th of the Education in Lieu of Incarceration Committee down in Boise that's working on seeing whether or not uh, that's a program that we'll be able to develop into something meaningful. Um, other than those two meetings, the third item I wanted to comment on was uh, kind of a disappointing um, discussion I had that uh, Judy Meyer and I had, and she has an announcement she'd like to make. Am I supposed to do that now? Right now. Oh my goodness, okay. Um, it, and that is in fact a letter to, to read to the college community, to Chair Howard and fellow board members. It is with sadness and gladness that I submit my resignation from the North Idaho College Board of Trustees, effective January 31st, 2018. Sadness because I have enjoyed my service to NIC in the community and I will miss all the relationships. I am proud how NIC has grown over the years to serve North Idaho. I'm also glad because the college is on grand, a good trajectory with sound leadership. And glad because my personal time commitment to higher ed governance since 1990 will be reduced and I'll get a bit of my life back as well. Outstanding and dedicated people at NIC are the core of the college. I thank the board, the students, the administration, faculty, and staff for their commitment to make NIC such a special place. Education is fundamental to the success and prosperity of our students and our region. The community college model is key to raising the skill and ability levels of our citizens. It's affordable, responsive to local needs, and most of all, agile to deal with our changing priorities. As most of, you, most of you have heard over the years, my mantra has been collaboration. I'm especially pleased with the coordination among all the providers on the higher ed campus. Idaho needs an efficient delivery system and the NIC U of I LCSC partnership is excellent. The college is on a solid course. It is now time for me to step aside and let others have the joy of participating in leading the college to the next level. This Sufi blessing sums up my philosophy. From you I receive, to you I give. Together we share, and by this we live. My thanks to you all for selecting me to serve NIC. It's a remarkable gem <laughs> in our region. Thank you, Judy. I'll say <laughs> And I must be sure to clarify, just because I resigned doesn't mean I'm not going to be championing, participating, and excited and delighted for you all. And well, I'm, and the good news is we've still got you for at least two more that, That's true. Did and you part give of, the date? Did I you? did the date as, as January 31st, thinking with the holidays and whatever process we need to do to give time for folks to indicate an interest in the IIC board. Uh, we can't have any gaps in there, so I'll be happy to, to uh, participate in whatever way works best for the college. <laughs> Right. And uh, Mark, let me ask you to just give us an outline. <clears throat> um, we, we have a procedure we need to follow of some sort in order to give public notice and give opportunity for the board to interview applicants and then make a decision. Um. Certainly, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the statutes uh, simply provide that when there is a vacation, the board is to select a replacement. So how you do that is, is, is really up to the board. What, is, what I recall has happened in the past is the, the board will, will set a timeline for people in the community, make some announcements so people know, set a timeline for letters of application or letters of interest. Then the board will go through, vet those, and select the people that they would like to talk to or interview for the position. And, uh, and then ultimately the board makes the selection. Okay, thank you. Uh, Christy. Mr. Chair, I would, um, I know we're gonna have plenty of time to talk to Judy and, mm -hmm. and talk, work our way through this, um, but I don't, I at least wanna be able to say tonight how special you are to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> You've been a role model, a mentor, I uh -oh. can't talk or I'll uh -oh. get emotional, but <laughs> not only you, your wonderful Many husband, times. Steve Meyer, the two of you have just devoted decades to this institution and, and the you. community at large. And we'll talk more about it. We're not a, <laughs> I'm more of a mess than you thank are. You, thank you, Christy. <laughs> uh, 
and I think your, your comments are, are appreciated and treasured by both Steve and myself. More importantly, the reason we could and would want to do this is because of the college community. It's a, a treasure and a gem, as I've said. It's been a delight for us both to work with you uh, and, and for us all, and we'll continue that. You just uh, uh, have different different perspectives, which gives me a chance to probably poke at things in a different way. So look out. There you go. Here we go. We'll Thank look you. for it. Okay, um, I'm going to um, take the prerogative of the ex chair, and uh, <laughs> we have to set up some kind of procedure to get this rolling. So I'm going to ask the administration if they would uh, uh, do what is necessary to advertise uh, the opening, uh, invite applicants to submit written applications um, with a brief summary of their background and qualifications, and that uh, we have those um, applications submitted no later than... Um, what, what was the timeline when we replaced Mr. Nilsson? I would think that process would be... Yeah, I, I can't remember, but, I, you know, we need to give uh, three or four weeks anyway. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm just like thinking we just did that about, about a year and a half ago, right. so... Came in in uh, late August and uh, interviewed with the board, and I answered questions, and you interviewed another candidate. And I think you sent an email from some far-flung place again, or some vacation yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> so anyway. But still, we need to put a deadline on it so that th so that we know when the applicants are. Uh, and so we'll we'll go ahead and do that, and, and then I'll uh, and then make sure we communicate to the board what we're recommending from a timeline perspective. That'd be and, great. Uh, okay. And get it set up. And give us time that we could do interviews of the applicants, with the un with the understanding that we'd like to um, make a selection no later than the meeting in January. Mm -hmm. So that you can. Uh, okay. <laughs> we Especially since there's that. no February meeting. We should be able to do that. Boise. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the meeting's a little earlier in January. We meet before you go to Boise. Yeah. Okay. That's all my report. Any remarks for the good of the order? Judy. A couple here, Mr. Chairman. One is to remind everybody tonight the uh, gathering of the bands is occurring. I think we were talking about that earlier, which is always fun. Uh, two others that are just uh, highlights, sad lights, as we talk sadness and gladness, to recognize that we lost a student. And I think you, Mr. President, sent uh, information out to the campus saying we both lost a student through an automobile accident and that uh, we have resources available for folks that are having difficulty with that because it is a difficult time. So both sorry for the loss and hopefully the college is able to help folks deal with that. The other is an, another loss that I uh, uh, will comment just briefly about and that was a longtime personal friend. This is where I fall apart. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, because Joe Webb uh, was my mentor and we laugh about being mentors or tormentors and she was indeed <laughs> my mentor. Uh, she was one of the first people I met in Coeur d'Alene in the early 70s when we came, or late 60s, early 70s when we came to Coeur d'Alene. She introduced me to the NIC and said, gee, you ought to take a look at that. It's just a great organization. She was on the board for a while. She was part of the, the uh, uh, foundation. Uh, and she passed away at 98 uh, in Seattle now because she joined her family there. But uh, she was one of the leaders in helping acquire the land, the beach, the waterfront land. Uh, and because she could see the value of that and help the college understand the value of it and I think arrange for some of the funding through the Department of, of um, Outdoor Recreation. I'm not sure the department. But anyway, there is an article in the um, Alumni and Friends. I would encourage you to read it. As a woman role model, as one of the earliest engineers, uh, went off to London to do some uh, uh, presentations there as a woman engineer. Uh, ahead of her time and a role model for us that I think helps make NIC such a special place. Um, that completes my comments. Thank you. Any other comments for the good of the order? Yeah, I, I would just like to say uh, new to the board, uh, came onto the board. I see a great diversity in viewpoints. I think that's a strength of a board. And I'd just like to say to Ken that I think you have yeah. shown ex extreme uh, excellent leadership. Uh, I've been, I've worked with a lot of boards, and uh, yes. you have a great leadership, and I really appreciate your time in the chair, although it was only one year f with me, but I uh, appreciate <laughs> your time. Thank you. Uh, next meeting, I'm sitting down there, and you're over here. <laughs> you're not, you will not be the chair at that point. <laughs> you said gleefully. <laughs> Thanks. Hearing no more. We are adjourned. Thank you.
Yeah, now you just have to.